changing. The subject of this discussion, then, is roots of prejudice. But before we start, let me introduce you to the four student participants. From India, Spadminav Gopina. From the United Kingdom, Sarah Chat. From Pakistan, Amin John. And from the Philippines, Edward Dennis Normandy III. <laughs> Now, before we start our discussion, I suppose we ought to find out just what you really mean by prejudice. What do you think prejudice is, Gopi? I think prejudice is willful ignorance. Uh, it is dictated only by emotion, and the fear and suspicion it creates uh, has caused more bloodshed than anything else I can think of. It is also the sh a sure sign of an inferiority complex. And I would like to, I agree wholeheartedly with Gopi, and I would like to emphasize that it's usually connected with animate objects. Like, one doesn't go into a shop and see a dress and say, ah, a dress, it must be cotton, all dresses are cotton. But um, one might well say, oh, that man's a merchant, all merchants are bad, therefore that man is bad. And I feel that's done a lot in nationwide um, relations, which is what Gopi was saying. In my opinion, prejudice is the holding of an opinion without certifying its correctness. It is part of human nature. It can be very dangerous if it is used for personal ends or for exploitation of the masses. But in its essence, prejudice is something that is part of human nature, and so it, it, is, it serves a useful end. Well, I think prejudice is some sort of an opinion formed be beforehand and not taking time out to judge fairly and its basis is mostly emotion, as Amin said. But uh, I think prejudice has two aspects. It, is, it has the positive and the negative, because there can be prejudices which are against something and prejudices which can be for something. Uh, would it be fair to ask the four of you uh, uh, what some of your own prejudices are? Do you have any, Gopi? Well, uh, I've always thought the Muslims were a very merciless and a very cruel race. How about you, Sarah? Well, I'd like to agree with Gopi because we have the phrase in England, the terrible Turks, which makes us think all Muslims are bad. And also, I'm afraid I rather agree with my mother in many respects, and she's prejudiced against all foreigners. I hope you have changed opinion by seeing me. <laughs> uh, well, uh, my main prejudice is, uh, I think, just the uh, uh, opposite of Gopi. Uh, I'm very much prejudiced against the Hindus. I find them very intolerant and and believing in the caste system, and uh, I think I'm very prejudiced against them. How about you, Dennis? Well, in the Philippines, during World War II, the Japanese invaded the land, and soon the level lawns of the cemeteries were lined with crosses and graveyards, and uh, out of the war rose the specter of hate for the Japanese. So that would be your main prejudice. Well, now, what do you think? You've told us the origin of your prejudice against Japanese, which is certainly understandable from a Philippine point of view. What are the origin of, what's the origin of your prejudice against Muslims, Gopi, do you know? Well, uh, I think perhaps it was something that happened in my childhood. Uh, I had a very strict uh, Muslim teacher who used to use the cane very frequently, <laughs> and no amount of pleading, no amount of protestations of innocence would change his mind. And I think that's why I've generalized from one instance, and now I've got a rooted belief that all Muslims are hard and uh, merciless. I feel that perhaps um, prejudice begins from the very earliest ages, um, when one is first beginning to learn to understand. I know even in nursery rhymes one often has this feeling. We have a nursery rhyme in England which is, Taffy was a Welshman, Taffy was a thief. And uh, I go around thinking all Welshmen are thieves, which is completely wrong. And I was thinking the other day, perhaps prejudice is a little bit like a glass of water. And if you had a large glass of water and dropped little drops of pink water into it, and you just looked at the glass of water, it would look the same. But if you suddenly held it up against a broad sheet of white paper, then you would realize that that water was painted pink from all those little drops that you had been dropping into it. And I know that these last 17 years, I've had those little drops of prejudice being dropped into me. And now that I'm in the forum group, and I'm with India, Pakistan, Philippines, and all the others, I realize how wrong my prejudices were. I, too, have been blinded by centuries-old prejudices. Uh, the good qualities of Hindus have no significance to me. I think it was during the, the times of uh, partition, when I saw all the bloodshed and the misery that we, uh, that we experienced, it was from that that I uh, experienced this prejudice, and it is very deep-rooted. Excuse me, Sarah, go ahead. 
Um, well, I was going to think that perhaps in the stories too that one is taught, um, one tends to um, get this feeling of prejudice. For instance, in religion, I always feel that Christ was English and uh, I cannot imagine him as being Armenian or as a Jew. And there's just been a painting that's been shown of Christ as a Negro, which to me seems repulsive. And um, then again, in these stories that we have of the Knights of the Round Table and of all great people, I always seem to think that they're English, and aren't I lucky to be an English person because it's so nice? Well, that's extremely interesting because um, I've noticed that most uh, Englishmen think that history began with the signing of the Magna Carta. Yes. It might be of some interest uh, to you to know that history began some 3,000 years before that in the river valleys of the Indus, uh, when your savage Anglo-Saxons were still running about dressed in skins. And it's also <laughs> an interesting fact uh, that my country and, that and the prejudices which um, my friend Amin has pointed out as the caste system originated in part from a decadent civilization. Uh, the ancient Hindu civilization had become decadent and realizing well the faults which lay inside themselves, uh, they, they threw up these race barriers and this was the beginning of the caste system. But I must say as far as intolerance is concerned, the Muslim surely has few parallels in history. <laughs> oh, that, we come to a very strange question because um, our religion totally prohibits intolerance. In fact, Quran says that there is no compulsion in religion. We believe in absolute freedom. And from what, judging from what has been happening in Kashmir, I, I have the impression that you deny human rights, the ba basic freedom of opinion which, which you talk so much about. And that has, of course, it, I may be wrong, but that has what... Uh, what has deep-seated deep this prejudice of mine? Well, the, I don't quite see how the question of Kashmir ties in with prejudice. The question of Kashmir has been discussed by better men, if I may yes. say so, than <laughs> us. Uh, and uh, as to the point of view, as uh, the Quran says that uh, you should never force your religion upon anyone, it might be of interest to you, for you to know that in the Muslim, uh, the Muslim kings who ruled India for, for what, five, six centuries uh, imposed certain taxes on those who were non-Hindus. They also, the invasions from the north were with, from, uh, from Muslim countries was with a view to forcible conversion. And I'm sure that the, the example that the Muslims are set in intolerance is not restricted to India alone. Uh, uh, just a second. Uh, don't, you, uh, don't you know the history of the Mughal period when King Akbar, who, had, uh, who was so tolerant towards the Hindus that he even married uh, him, I, Hindu women and, and uh, have, uh, he ha had all the Hindus in his mi ministry and uh, the whole country was going on all right. I don't see it's why. I, uh, if certain people have made mistakes, it's not the fault of the religion or anything. Precisely. Uh, uh, Akbar merely is, is the exception that proves the rule. Akbar was the only exception to all those Hindu, uh, all uh, those Muslim rulers. There was no other man. As a matter of fact, uh, most of the Mughal rulers, except the last ones, were very, very tolerant towards the Hindus. That's uh, what I have studied in history. I don't know. Uh, could we leave the history a little bit and come back to present day um, prejudices? Um, you were saying that you were prejudiced against the Japanese, yes, I think, I Dennis. Was. Um, would you like to. Well, personally, it's because I lost my father during the war. In the Philippines, there has been a reconstruction program for houses. But a house is more realistically not a house, not a home, but a house without a father. And. Uh, a couple of years back, my mother was invited by the Japanese woman to go over to the uh, to Japan because she's president of the National Gold Star War Widows Association of the Philippines. And uh, we certainly didn't want to go, but after a few hours of deliberation, we went. And uh, when we were at the airport, I felt rather awful because I knew that in my heart, I couldn't look at the Japanese straight in the eye and say that there was no bitterness in my heart. But then when after our two months stay in Japan when we saw all the people and we saw how the mothers and the children and the, and the wives had suffered just as much as we did we, we saw that war is a two-sided thing not only one section suffers from the war and then a few nights before we left there was an old woman who came to our hotel and she talked to my mother and she had a quilt it was, in the, it was designed like a tree and she explained that uh, her uh, boy her only son planted that tree before he left for battle, which was in the Philippines. And uh, that son never came back. And then all of a sudden she knelt to my mother and said, if it was my son that killed your husband, please forgive him. I'm on my knees to you asking for your forgiveness. Because I don't think my son was very bad. 
well, maybe war did something against maybe war did something which made him do that you know how it is if you you have two sons you know how it is if you should lose both of them in war perhaps my son would want someone from the philippines to have this and that did it because when we left japan and i we were in the airplane i looked back at the people in tokyo i i guess i was leaving behind all my bitterness and prejudice i was leaving a new man and i felt that I was leaving with a better understanding of love and brotherly understanding. That's a dramatic example, Dennis, of how you can lose your prejudices. The mere fact that they were so strong at the beginning made the conversion, I suppose, all the more dramatic. I'm sorry, Sarah, I interrupted you. I was just thinking that there, um, Dennis had um, lost his prejudice from meeting the Japanese yes, people. Yes, the contact was the one that made it. I think that's the, one of the easiest ways to remove a prejudice, to get to really know a people and see what, what ideas you have which are well, wrong. Well, I had completely the opposite experience because um, most people in Britain are prejudiced against Germans because we did suffer a lot during the Second World War. But I personally was not. I thought, well, they've suffered the same in my childlike manner, and uh, I thought I'd like them. But I happened to meet a German who was charming enough, but through one action made me dislike him. And through the fact that I disliked the one German, it made me think, well, all Germans must be as bad as other people are saying. And therefore, I, I got a prejudice from meeting somebody. I don't think personal contact is always the way of solving prejudices. And also, you were saying that um, colonialism, the prejudice against it was justified. Perhaps um, you'd like to speak a little bit more about that, because I'd like you to. <laughs> well... Uh, I'm sure many, many enlightened people, even in the British Empire, are uh, beginning to realize that uh, your policy of colonialism uh, is not entirely but justified. But what is our policy? What would you say our policy was? Was? No, of, or of is. Of exploiting. Uh, is, but now you're retreating. There's nothing else you can do but <laughs> retreat. After all, you must move with the spirit of the times. As it is, uh, as it is you have been sticking on to old outposts, but I'm afraid that the times are against you and you have to shift back. Your policy was, at one time, to uh, get hold of certain colonies in the far-flung outposts and say the sun never sets over the British Empire and make full use of these colonies and be prejudi prejudiced in favor of these colonies as long as they were prejudiced in favor of you. That was your policy in the past. Of course, now you cannot, I don't think, uh, hold well, the same no, position. No, I, I would like to disagree upon that because in the past it was a matter of trade and we were often going to underdeveloped areas and we were giving them a lot of help. Oh, yes. Now, if you're going to say colonialism is so bad, why should Malta, in 1814, wish to come into the, under the British protection? Why should the Fiji Islands, in 1874, or Sarawak, as late as 1946, wish to come under the British protection? And uh -huh. then again, to go on to the um, Berlin um, Conference of European Nations, which I think was in 1884 and 1885, when we had this conference of Euro European nations who were interested in Africa. Mm -hmm. And there, Britain put forward the unique idea at that time that perhaps the African nations could be brought to a democratic way of life, like the USA had, because mm -hmm. you were once our colonies, yes. America oh, see, and yes. Canada yes. and yes. Australia, yes. and like the Western civilized Asian countries, like India, Burma, oh. and Ceylon. Mm -hmm. There, um, Britain put forward this idea, mm -hmm. and it has been proved that our policy was right, because you now have on March the 6th, the Gold Coast going to have her independence. Mm -hmm. In another 12 months, you have Malaya going to have her independence. And you have these countries, which have been colonies, and which is even more amazing, remaining friendly towards us. Because I would say that India was friendly towards Britain. I should say so, and that is a credit which lies entirely with us and not with you. And in the second place, I should also say that your policy of uh, saying that uh, all these countries wished for it, it was you who was putting the wish in their mouths. There was not much they could do. So what is Sarawak, by the way? Who are the responsible people in Sarawak? It's a rainforest. And anyway, the British come there and say, after all, Sarawak wants nothing. Sar the rainforest never speaks anyway. And then you, you, get, get your, uh, uh, you give them a democratic way of life in due course of time. You are not giving those people a democratic way of life because you feel they ought to give it. This is just a camouflage retreat from a position you know is no longer tenable. But before, they did not have a democratic way of life. You had a system of um, the chief, um, uh, 
always being king, um, mm -hmm. a bit like the royal family, but um, yeah. he was definitely king. Yeah. Um, you often had a system of slavery, which I think mm -hmm. still exists in parts of Africa mm -hmm. and also in parts of the Middle East, so the headlines are telling us. And um, Britain went in there and she gave them this democratic heritage, which people are adopting. You cannot get away from the fact that however much they hated us, still people are taking up exactly the same democratic way of life that we have taught them. And how, Armin, could you say that um, colonialism is, is no good? You said something at the beginning. I about think that that, that, um, that we retarded you or we, something. We do, uh, we do admit that we did gain some advantages from colonial rule, but what you took out of us and the amount of damage that you have done, uh, just look at us. Now we are in a society that, that can be compared to a society in, in a medieval period. And uh, 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 moreover, I think that your policy was such to create uh, differences between, uh, within the country so that we could not be united and rule uh, our, and, and throw you off. So uh, that has resulted in many of our pre present day problems between India and Pakistan. That's my I own agree. personal view. Yes, I, but I but hardly what, agree with you. So, but yeah. what would have happened if Britain had never come here? Do you think that Pakistan I, would have advanced beyond Britain? I said that I admit that we do owe that democratic way of life and we do and owe also the railways and also the dams yes. and also the way of yes. agriculture but and also the way of education right. and also the way of government yes. but the amount of yes and yes sarah sarah the amount of wealth you took out of india that is nothing compared to what you did for us yes. you what? took tremendous amount of wealth you built up the whole british Kingdom from India. But, wh but what is material wealth? Oh, compared indeed, what is no, material yes, wealth? but what is it? A, a oh, little yeah. bit. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what material wealth is. And I wonder. Do you, you realize that without material wealth, your great empire would not have lasted a single moment? And do you also realize that it was because of our wealth, with our, our crops, our cotton, our jute, which has helped to make you a great empire? And after, in return for this, you offer us a vaguely nebulous democratic way of life, which you would have come to anyway. Well, I would, li I would like to say that, first of all, material wealth is something which does not last. Perhaps no it's doubt. rather nice for one generation, oh, yes. as we ourselves have seen, because I admit that we took it from you. But what does last are the ideals, are the way of life, mm -hmm. are what are men's thoughts. And it is Britain, I would say, um, together with the ancient um, Athenians, Oh. Um, yes, I class ourselves with the ancient Athenians out, yes. of being full of ideals and of brilliant ideas yes. that have helped the world forward to progress, irrespective of the damage we might have done on the way with material Indeed. goods. Yes, that's most interesting. It might interest you now, in turn, to know that democracy is not your gift alone to the world. No, we not my India own. Had in too. your country. Uh, or I even you claim from the Greek heritage. Yes. It is a fallacy to which many of your countrymen are subject. Anyway, <laughs> I would say that uh, you've got most of your ideas from Rome more than Greece. Yes. And from, um, in my country, I think we had the ideals of democracy long before they were ever thought of in your little island. When did you have the ideals of we democracy? We had the ideals of democracy. We had the village councils, what we call the village panchayats, where the elected elders of the village managed the village as an administrative unit. That was done as far back as 3,500 years before Christ. Well, I think I... <laughs> yes, you do, yes. I, <laughs> I shall have to admit that uh, here am I defending our British way of life. Sarah, uh, let me interrupt just a moment. After Gopi and Amin had argued so violently with their prejudices against each other, did I understand them to say that they really would have loved each other very much if it hadn't been for the British who yes, came in and yes, divided them. Well, let's follow that one Thank out. Thank you. Bit. Yes, I think uh, now by talking to Gopi, we are coming much more closer and I do hope, let us hope that when Gopi becomes uh, the leader of his country, he will uh, <laughs> show much more uh, tolerance and a better way to settle things without... without uh, uh, but but without how did Britain make the Hindus hate the Muslims? How did Britain make that happen? Uh, because, you know, uh, a, a country that is ruling another one, it doesn't want it to rise economically as well as intellectually. So it will do anything that uh, possible to keep the people uh, uh, away from learning and away from uh, other, other means of progress. It will keep them from uniting. Uh, you know, of course, if they unite, you'd be nowhere. They'd uh, build up, a, uh, they'd start thinking of uh, independence and they'd start thinking of, uh, of breaking away. And that's what happened after the mutiny. Uh, the rena renaissance followed and, and so you had to give the, give the colonies up and, and that's 
one of the reasons uh, of the present day problems. I, that's I my own I entirely disagree. I think it's something that's ingrained in the Hindus and the Muslims from time immemorial when we were little painted blue savages running around in skins. <laughs> well, uh, let me tell you, by the time when you are little blue painted savages <laughs> running around in skins, as you most aptly put it, <laughs> the Muslims did not exist. Uh, they came in very much later. Uh, and in the second place, uh, although I agree that in later years there was some friction, you definitely played off the Muslims against each other. You left us with a great heritage of a divided country after you left with the fanfare. Well, and how is it, if you um, say this so scathingly, that um, I was listening to one of your um, top present um, Indian people, the Maharaj of Patiala, I hope he doesn't mind my quoting him, but he was speaking at the Fairleigh Dickinson um, University, um, near Woodridge in New Jersey the other day and he was saying that um, the British left India but did not leave her unfriendly towards her and that the British left as friends and as gentlemen and it is that friendship which binds India to the Commonwealth. Well if there's such friendship I'm sure that that friendship could never have arisen if we had been playing such petty politics and even your President Nehru in his speech um, in 1950 um, in honor of the Australian Prime Minister um, said that it was the friendly approach in the Commonwealth that counts. I agree it's a friendly approach in the Commonwealth that counts. And I said it is our generosity which has made it possible towards you, our friendliness I, towards I do you. not think so. I, I think when do you think your uh, feeling against the British began? Was it there the moment the British came into India? Or did they do things wrong? I do not think so. I don't think when the British first came to my country they were, as Sarah said, as traders as merchants. And in the beginning, they were very sympathetic. They absorbed the culture of the masses. Uh, but as very soon after, I should say in about 20 years afterwards, when more and more Englishmen began to come in after the opening of the Suez Canal, at once they formed a clique. Uh, they formed a clique of superior people. These were the subject masses. Never again did they come to penetrate to the lower levels, as we call the great lords and the natives, as you called us, the <laughs> natives. <laughs> and uh, as soon as this happened, th from that minute onwards, the British supremacy uh, was in danger. And I think it's from that minute that the bitterness began, actually. Um, could I say here, um, I, I know this perhaps is not right for me to say in this context, but I came over here thinking that always our colonial policy had been right. I definitely believed that the whole world should be grateful to us for everything that we had done for them. Of course, we have done a lot for them, and I genuinely believe that. But having come in contact with so many um, people who I expected to rush into my arms and say, oh, darling, mother country, and realize that they don't do that and that they rather resent our help, I'm beginning to wonder whether we should have ever gone there in the first place. But the minute I wonder, were we right? to go in and attack what we considered a barbarous nation. Then I begin to consider, well, what would that nation have been like today? Would it have managed to progress itself? Or would it be just another nation which would have been taken in under the communist wing? Well, uh, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know exactly as to that. But I'm sure that democracy could have evolved on its own. It's not necessarily, it was not injected by you into our veins. We did not require that injection. I'm sure we could have done it in time. Perhaps I never deny that we owe you a great deal of things. But the trouble is that you take so patronizing an air, think that all that you have bestowed on us is sheer it's gratitude. It's true, yes. yes. <laughs> is it fair to our time's almost up? Can I quickly ask you what the dominant prejudice in your country is today? Would it correspond to your own? What is the dominant prejudice in India today, would you say, Gopi? Well, uh, the caste system, as I said, is rapidly wearing out, so that wouldn't be the dominant thing. I have not noticed any great uh, Indo-Muslim uh, feeling uh, in my country, uh, but as in most other colonies of the British Empire, there is definitely a prejudice uh, against things American. This, I'm sure, would be found in every British colony. Is that so something you share with Sarah? Um, yes, definitely. Um, there is this feeling of anti-Americanism in my country, which I don't know whether you'd call prejudice, because I think it's based in some respects upon what we have seen of what, what we dislike, perhaps, in the American foreign policy. Uh, what would you say is the dominant prejudice if there is one in Pakistan today? Uh, well, uh, people in Pakistan are very touchy on the subject of colonialism. And with the United States aid that is coming there, they, they are thinking that whether uh, they've just received their independence <coughs> from the Brit British and they are being uh, now selling their freedom to, to America. But 
after studying in American schools, I found that Americans ha don't have any territorial ambitions and, and that uh, that uh, what they are doing is only for our own good and at the request of our own government. And so uh, that, ha that was the prejudice that I had been under and which, which has been uh, clearing up. But it really didn't clear up until you came here? I, yes, yes. This is fascinating. Let's uh, stay just one second longer on this. Gopi, have you had any prejudices that you arrived with that have been dispelled yes. since you've been yes, here? Yes, that's true. Uh, I had one. <clears throat> I always thought that Americans were insincere since they were too voluble too friendly. I thought this too uh, coming out too much and being too friendly is always a uh, sign of being shallow. Uh, I think this is a feeling which most Asians, with their, uh, with their they are rather a silent people as a race, and they always think that expressions of uh, too much friendship is always likely to be regarded with suspicion. I'm glad to say, however, that since I've come here, I found that the American is genuinely sincere. How about you, Sarah? Have you? I Drop came with prejudices? a whole pile of prejudices, and I think I've dropped pretty well all of them, to the best of my knowledge, except that I still dislike your form of government. I wouldn't exchange ours for anything. <laughs> you mean parliamentary? Our cabinet system of government. Well, I you can't have a president good. belonging to one party and the no. Congress to the other. How about you, Dennis? Well, this, the, there seems to be a wrong kind of propaganda that gets to the Philippines about American teenagers. Most of the uh, things that we get about American teenagers are that they're uh, sort of hoodlums, and uh, we get only the wrong idea. I think America should sort of reduce their propaganda and uh, give us the right sort of thing. Thank you. We'll talk more about this on another program. Until next week, when we'll talk again about prejudice.